Welcome to Silly Intros with Chuck, the part of the show where Chuck comes out and does a silly intro. <laughs> we don't really make enough VeggieTale references. <laughs> no, we don't. We should. Yeah, they'd be, yeah, they're easy. They're just, you're just easy. They're out easy there. Easy peasy. Oh boy. Mm. Uh, this is Brady Harden. You are listening to Life After, and with me as always is <laughs> uh, the. Oh, what's the... It's like, did you forget your name? Uh, Larry the Cucumber. Larry the Cucumber. Yeah. Also known as Chuck Parsons. (laughs) Hey, uh, Chuck, we have an interesting... I was trying to think of Barbara Manatee. I really wanted to come in with Barbara Manatee. Oh, And with our... And here's our co-host, Barbara Barbara Manatee. Manatee. (laughs) (laughs) She would be an amazing co-host. Brady, what are we we getting into today? Well, you know, we've we've had the show for uh, quite a few episodes now, and um, our goal is just to shit on as many things inside of the Christian culture as we can, (laughs) you know? And you know what we have not touched on yet? What's that? Missions. Oh, missions. Yeah, so we have a very interesting guest today. And, and I'm, I, I accidentally said kidding, omissions, like sin. We're not talking about sins of omission. We're talking about yeah, missions. Like the 1040 window or whatever like, that was called. Right, right. <laughs> the 1040. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. Wow, you pulled that out. Whoa. Yeah. Uh, whereas my church always had the, the illustrations of you will go on to your, Jerusalem and israel into all parts of the earth quoting was at acts to yeah, whatever yeah, yeah yeah um no that's that's actually the end of matthew but just same thing oh you're right it was in the great commission? the great commission oh that's triggering to jerusalem and judea and samaria and to the ends of the earth and to the ends of the earth that was our that was our our motto like we would do like our community and in our state and then our nation and we would do international missions okay but yeah. a lot of people always took it as a like, oh, as an order i love that, that people to, i love that white people can't not make bullet points out of things you know and it's it has like, to be like a cross well yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, and to jerusalem and judea and samaria and to the ends of the earth and they're like well that means for us we got to start in in our neighborhood and then we got to go to Illinois, and then yeah, had to go to the ends of the earth. You know that people two thousand years ago were like, "No, I don't want to minister to my own community. I want to get in an airplane right. and go over to right. Native America." And yeah. mission- <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Like, right. they had to make little points out of everything. That's like that's not what it's trying to say. Native America. Native America. <laughs> I guess um, everything was native at that point, right? Yeah, yeah. For you know, sure. I mean, there's even within uh, within Christianity today, there's a lot of criticism of short term missions. Mm-hmm. Um, just as like uh, as we're realizing that like um, it's not the role of white Western like European culture to save the entire planet. Oh God, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, there's this weird. Uh, we do this this short term mission thing where we're like pack up your things. We're going to go meet some people that you're only going to see once, but we're going to impact their lives, you know? Yeah. We're going to make changes to the world. So, tell me about your, what is your experience with, with short-term missions? Oh, man. My started when I was in junior high. Um, my church started a new missions organization, and they were going to send a very small team of like eight people. That was going to be like the first time they did it, and they handpicked all the people, and they wanted to have a youth go and so they chose me and okay. then also like the director's son and so we were the only like two t dangers and then that started and it became like this big thing that kept on going and so i ended up you were the with, chosen youth i was the chosen you were youth, the dalai yeah. lama of this mission trip <laughs> basically i was like the poster child of like right so like oh we wanted to be like that kid you know so i did that <laughs> and then for like eight years in a row i would go every year and build houses um and we would like you know preach and do all that stuff so that was to Mexico. Um, also, my youth group, we did a lot. We'd go to, we went to Greeley, Colorado for some reason, <laughs> which was really close to, and we just happened to like, oh, while we're here, let's go to Colorado Springs and check out, you know, That's Focus convenient. on the Family. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, also, nice. white, whitewater rafting. Thank mm-hmm. you. Um, and so we did that. I did a couple other, like we went to Miami, a couple other like little ones within the nation um, okay. with my youth group. But then later on, uh, when I was, you know, about Four or five years before me leaving the faith, I went to um, uh, went to the Middle East. Okay. No, it was like two or three because it was right before I got married. So I went to the Middle East, and uh, I went to Lebanon, and I met with a pastor there who was a friend of mine. We uh, he was like in his sixties and stayed at his place. And we went into Jordan and Syria. Went to an orphanage. Into the ends of the earth. Into the ends of the earth. I mean, I went to the Middle East like. 
Yeah, that's like the ends of the earth, right? So you went, uh, so for me at least, you so you did it. You see, this is kind of the standard run, right? Like you do an orphanage, you do like a church ministry where you like hand out food or something, mm-hmm. and you do you go to a church where you don't understand what's happening, mm-hmm. and uh, you build something. Well, I gave a I gave a Bible to a Lebanese boy, and he gave me a kiss on the cheek. Oh, yeah, that was confusing. Oh my, that was, was confusing. He was cute. <laughs> <laughs> was it that was it was just a cultural kiss on the cheek right i don't, you didn't i don't know I, don't, I think you can you never know is lebanon one of those countries where you can just get like murdered on the spot for being queer no no lebanon is pretty americanized oh, okay. uh but i mean you would definitely get harassments and you right, know, it'd be right. dangerous but uh, i mean i was also in jordan and Le- like jordan and then syria is like the worst mm-hmm. so it's kind of like a you know like a green oh yeah yellow red situation you know what i mean right right, right. Yeah. i get you what about you what mission trips did you do um so i all of my mission trips i didn't start going until i was an adult to on mission trips because mm-hmm. i could never afford them slash get my parents to pay for them when i was a teenager mm-hmm. so um i went to i was also like really uh i was I, until i was in my 20s i was really culturally shy so like the idea of going somewhere where i didn't speak the language was really intimidating i didn't want to do it Um, but, uh, all of my mission trips were to Belize, uh, actually to the same place, like the same area, the same church. Um, and, uh, it was, I mean, it was a really cool experience, you know, it was, uh, uh, I I have friends down there that I still have, even though I don't know how they'd feel about this podcast, (laughs) you know, but they're also, I mean, they're like not super judgmental people. So, um, it's cool. I, I actually, strangely enough, am, uh, as of like, as of like less than a year, I'm going to say like six months ago, a friend of mine was down there and this one family still has a, a picture of me and my ex-wife on their mantle. So like we made some pretty close. Oh my God. Yeah. We had some pretty close relationships. Do they think you guys are still married? No, they know nobody, we're not. They know oh, we're not married anymore. I was like, nobody needs to they tell just, them that's heartbreaking. Yeah. No, no, no. They know we're in, We actually, uh, we actually went down there together after we got divorced. <laughs> Just to say, well, we hey, were we just we were you. still really close with the people, and we both wanted to go. And it was that's like, awesome. Oh. I tried to learn Spanish because I thought that that might be ha- helpful for me. Yeah, yeah. I started to learn Spanish for a while. And um, ask me how much of it I didn't remember. <laughs> Un pequeño. I actually went. I actually went on one of these trips after I deconstructed my faith. I was like, done. tell me about that. Uh, it was fine because I I don't know I just I just wanted to go down there to visit everybody and to like do some you know work if anybody needed help with their see like these are my friends now so I was like oh I want to go down there and like if like I think we built a house that year for somebody whose house was like in a floodplain okay so we like built a house that was on higher ground so they wouldn't their house wouldn't flood all the time you know sounds like a parable we just like. <laughs> In it, right, it does. <laughs> and the man who built his house on the higher ground trusteth to the Lord. Um, so my experience with short-term missions was is is pretty cool, but I would say overall, it's a really it's still a really weird institution, right? Yeah. It's still a really strange thing where we're like, uh, it's like it's it's I, I think a lot of like uh, economic analysts and like cultural analysts are are questioning like whether these you know short-term trips to a spot to like to apparently help the local you know people like improve their lives in some way slash like present this western version of the gospel is kind of it causes more problems than it does you know like it it westernizes it's just more westernization and it's also like these aren't long-term solutions necessarily mm-hmm. for, for what's going on in the country. It's like us sort of like giving ourselves a reason to pat ourselves on the back and then leave and like let them deal with the, the mess, right? So I know that uh, one of the years that I went to Mexico, um, we would drive this, like a tour bus basically, we had all of our luggage underneath. And they told us that they didn't want us to take all our donations across the border. So what we had to do is put all the clothes in our own like suitcases we just all shoved every all the donations in as fast as we could and we walked across the border and there was like 250 of us because i went to a mega church of course and so we'd go up to this like it's like a stop sign that you would see or a stoplight that you would see on the road and it would either give you a green light or a red light 
If you got red light, they had to check your luggage. So I went up to it and I got a green light, but they pulled me aside anyway for some reason. So the only people who got pulled out of our group was me and the worship leader. And uh, these guys with like these huge ass machine guns came up and they had us open up our suitcases. And mine was full of dresses and high heels and purses. And I had no clue. Uh-huh. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah. shit, yeah, this yeah. is so awkward. Right? <laughs> and I was like, oh, please don't shoot people who you cross like, dress in this nation. You were you like, know? well, this is embarrassing. Guys, I have something to tell you. <laughs> this, is, this is a really weird time to tell you all, but <laughs> I'm, I'm queer gay. and I'm here. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. That's right. Please don't shoot me. Brady um, does Lebanon. No, that was, a, that was in Mexico. <laughs> oh, that was Mexico. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, or you say like a Debbie does Dallas? Because I, I, I would do a Brady does Lebanon. Brady does. <laughs> right. uh, anyway, <laughs> moving on from that. Harden gets a hard on. In Lebanon. Yeah, there, there yeah, we go. Yeah, it'd be a series, kind of like, a, like the uh, it'd girls be a, with low it'd self-esteem be a fly, it'd be a Vice Land show. Yeah. It'd be a Vice Land show. I like that idea. Um, another thing that I find really interesting about missions is kind of like, I was a lot more fundamentalist than you were, obviously, Mm -hmm. you know, which is kind of interesting about us because we talked the other day about um, how you have like a wider knowledge of the Christian world. Yeah, I was really mean about it. (laughs) (laughs) It's okay. But mine's very like condensed and that just shows like our indoctrination was done in different ways. Uh Mine mine kept me like lasered focused Mm -hmm. on my denomination. Mm -hmm. And then I left Christianity a lot faster than you did. Like I just zoomed out the back door like an Irish goodbye. Right. Whereas you kind of like... Oh, it's getting late. I need to get going soon. You know uh-huh. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I zoomed out. A little bit. Um, but one thing that we always had to wrestle with with our fundamentalism is uh, is how does heaven work and how does... Um, like, for instance, we, we wanted to believe that everybody had the opportunity of hearing the gospel or rejecting the gospel. Um, and then, you know, people would say, well, what about the people who haven't heard? And we would have just like kind of bullshit answers like, well, I've heard a missions story once where somebody went to a tribe and one of the tribes people had a dream that sounded a lot like Jesus, uh-huh, you know, uh-huh. and that was kind of like yeah, in a way yeah, of yeah. like, oh, God wrote it in their hearts. And so they are responsible for right. even something that they didn't hear explicitly that I take for granted because I have to hear it every day. And how did that work in your belief system? Um, so, yeah, that, that was something I wrestled with a lot, actually, from the time that I was very conservative um when i was still in the in the conservative like baptist like going to a baptist church and stuff i was like the i mean i was always significantly more liberal than everybody else in my church that was Mm -hmm. just the role i always played so um i was always like well i think uh you know i think that people can be saved without knowing the name of jesus i think you know like god saves people however in whatever different ways you know Mm -hmm. Um, and there was, there's like some biblical example that a lot of like, that like Rob Bell or somebody would use or like, you know, uh, um, what was, uh, Brian McLaren or something. Yeah. Brian McLaren. Uh, Brian McLaren was a big, he was a big advocate for like, for like missions without, or for like, uh, salvation without the gospel. Okay. Um, so I kind of like, uh, I sort of like embraced that pretty early, like in late high school probably. Mm-hmm. And that was just sort of the philosophy that I ran with. It was like, there's really nothing specifically in the Bible that says that like, if you don't get the gospel, you're going to hell. There's no like verse where you can you can argue that. You can use a bunch of different verses and make a super verse to argue that. But like, there's no <laughs> there's no particular you know way to argue that so i just sort of ran with that yeah um so that made for me missions where it was never about spreading the gospel right like for me personally it was more about like um like like spreading the love of jesus or like you know um, okay. like like helping people that needed help in different parts of the world and but it was still spiritualized it was it was definitely a christian thing but it was not particularly like i'm here to save you from hell that wasn't really that was never my personal goal okay yeah as a fundamentalist that was definitely and yeah, yeah, yeah you were saying like it's more of just even like the little southern baptist like training that's like still living in me was like, i saw your face well, but actually <laughs> you know uh, <laughs> <laughs> I never met and never met a fundamentalist that could argue that could successfully argue against my case for 
for salvation with no one gets to the father except through you know so <laughs> except through christ but how do you get to christ uh, answer the, answer me that brady i don't know but i mean <laughs> you know but every every like belief system has to have that answer right. of like well how do you deal with that and so when i became reformed the answer was like well you know if you don't you know, if you don't repent and believe, then you're going to hell. And, uh, but also, and you'd be like, well, why is that ethical? How is that okay? And you'd be like, for the glory of God. Like, that was some sort right, of right. answer that, like, oh, when people burn in hell, then God gets more glory. God gets and when more glory. People, yeah. And when people don't burn in hell, God. And so it's just like, you still don't have an answer. You're just kind of giving, like, you know, like a hoorah for whatever you yeah. specifically put your emphasis on within your uh-huh. within your denomination or within your belief system. Do you put the emphasis on God first? And if you do, then you're going to fall for any answer that makes God sound like he's glorified in letting people who have never heard about him burn in hell because they didn't <laughs> accept him. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Well, they weren't among the elect, Brady. They weren't a part of the elect. Yeah, good God. <clears throat> uh, he would have found a way. It just happens to be that there's more in America uh, or places where the gospel is more easily read. He compared to other places and then it's almost like you project a little bit of like racism on god where it's like yeah he treats africans differently but that's right. because they're africans <laughs> right you know what i mean and like you use it to justify in your head and it's like god that's so backwards but then you'll say something like well they just appreciate the little that they have more than we appreciate the lot that we have and so we have a lot to learn from them but it's like yeah but you're talking about them still burning in hell forever because they (laughs) don't accept something that you hear every single sunday morning and sunday night and wednesday night and you know one other night in a week for your small group yeah so yeah missions were way more important for you than they were for me i was fundamentally i was just being i was being jesus to mm-hmm. the people of Belize. And we were beating Jesus. You were beating Jesus into the people of Lebanon. And Mexico and everywhere. Yeah. And Mexico. Into the, uh, to the ends of the earth. We wanted to get a little more in-depth with this international missions thing, so we sat down with our friend Corey Pig. Corey is a producer for the massive podcast The Liturgists, the Bible for Normal People podcast, as well as his own podcast, which launched this week called Failed Missionary, where Corey and his co-host Jamie Wright, otherwise known as blogger Jamie the Very Worst Missionary, and Emily Warall, the mastermind behind the hilarious Barbie Savior Instagram account, tackle the mostly unspoken problems with Western Christian missions. Here's our conversation with Corey. Um, all right, let's start now. <laughs> sure. So I grew up in rural Missouri um, in a pretty, I would say, secular family. Like my family had what I would consider fire insurance uh, mm-hmm. faith. So um, my dad's side of the family belonged to a Lutheran church at the time. And um, I chose not to go to the catechism and, I thought it was boring. It didn't do anything for me. Um, That, to my knowledge, upset my dad's family, or my my dad, I guess. He was very disappointed in that decision. Um, And then, uh, so about three years later, when I was 16, I don't know if you guys ever had this in your schools in St. Louis, but they had um, See You at the Pole events. Oh, yeah. yeah, I let it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, a lot of my uh, scene friends were becoming Christians in their youth groups. So, real quick, when Corey says scene friends, he's referring to the local music scene, the punk rock, emo, screamo, hardcore scene that was huge in the early 2000s, which is interesting because it reminded me that there was a brief period of time from about 2001 to 2009 where Christian bands were actually dominating the heavy music world, and a lot of music fans became Christians as a result, but maybe that's a different episode. And I could tell a change in their lives uh, in a way that I desired. So the see you after the poll event intrigued me. And, you know, afterwards they do the see you after the poll. And there's, you know, at that time it was like the Hillsong worship movement was just taking off. And so I think they were playing like save your King or something like that. Uh And, um, they pulled all the hard strings, but I I actually want to say that I genuinely think I experienced something and, um, that changed the course of my life. And so, when I graduated high school about two years later, I forfeited college and chose the vocation of a missionary and freaked my uh, parents out. So. <laughs> Perfect. Where um, did you want to go? Where, what was your like plan at that time? I, 
I don't know, to be honest, like I, I would always say I had really selfish intentions. Like I, I just wanted to, um, what I thought was share God's love. I, I had no motive in saving people or converting people. Um, and today looking back, I, I would say that that was driven by a lot of inner loneliness. You know, I, I came from a family that I didn't quite fit in with. And when I found God, it kind of found like I found that thing that I fit in with. And why would I not want to share that with the world? So, um, yeah. And I think there was something to the element of being with the pains of the world and, 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 and being of aid to that. That was inspiring. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, so let's, let's talk about how you got into, uh, the, the mission field, right? Uh, so, so tell us about your experience. What, what, what exposed you to that world? And, uh, I know eventually you were involved with what involved with YWAM. Did it, did it start there or, or how'd you get there? No. <clears throat> okay. So we're going to kind of scale it back to the, um, chapter right after high school. I got involved with a lot of Christian bands. Um, and I, I played synthesizer and these Christian worship bands and it led me to a charismatic church, which was like a mom and pop type situation. They had, what I mean by that is they had no um, board of elders. There was no oversight. They didn't belong to a denomination. They It was just the husband and wife. And um, I was heavily exploited by a guy that claimed to be a prophet in the church. And um, this was, so I left my family for six months. I didn't talk to them. I lived with one of my friends that was in the band. And um, wait, 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 Okay, hold on. What led, <laughs> what led you to stop talking to your family? <laughs> This guy, it was captivating. The guy was cap like the, the, the role of the, this prophet, the church, the community was captivating. They would tell me, um, your family's secular. They don't get it. Like if you spend time with them, um, it'll ruin the trajectory and the calling that God has on your life. Wow. So it's better Shit. that you Jesus. stay with us and yeah. you do this work. That's kind of the mentality that they had. And, um, the prophet was telling me all these things. And at the time I was like, it was very personal details of the people's lives in the church. And it was things that he had told them. And he told me that that was my training to be a prophet because he saw the same calling in my life and he was training me what he was really doing. And I found this out 10 years later was he was exposing massive trauma, mental, emotional, sexual from church staff to youth, to people in the church. And he saw me as a, pawn to expose stuff in a way that he could not mm, um, okay. in a roundabout way. That's the cleanest way I can put it. Sure. So I'm always, I've always been a pretty honest person. So I, I, I've always had this thing about my personality to call things out if I didn't like it or if I didn't feel like it was right, like a sense of justice. So I started clashing with this church community just from the trauma from that profit, but also just, there was also some things in the community and I ended up getting ousted from that community in a roundabout way. Um, and I booked a band like we, I I booked bands for the church or for the, mostly for my Christian band to play with. Really. We were trying Mm -hmm. to get exposure. Right. And there was, it was a band from Nashville called the glorious unseen. Oh yeah. I remember that. And, um, I had not like, I'm using verbiage, but that, that would be from that time. So I'm not, that's, this is not how I would, I would talk today, but I'm kind of just talking as I would then. So I, I had never felt God like that before. Um, they were like this ambient, honest worship band. Uh, Yeah. They were kind of like a, they were like a crossover between the, the punk scene and the worship scene. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. It was very, very slow, very like, yeah honest worship. It wasn't anything like fluffy and built up and fake. And, um, so that night I I was talking with a singer, um, and he, we had shared like what had just went on and how he had been in uh, similar situations. And he encouraged me to move to Nashville for spiritual healing. And I often wondered when I would find myself in Nashville, but, uh, our, the band I was in at the time, we had this weird development deal off MySpace, like with a Sparrow Records offshoot. Oh, MySpace. Oh, Sparrow Records offshoot. All right. Cool. Like back in the day, these weirdos would like be on the hunt for like the, what they thought was up and coming. Oh yeah, totally. Yeah. So it wasn't like a legitimate thing. It was actually more of a scam, but it got, it led me to Nashville and we, um, played for a label there 
um, I can't even remember who it was at this point, but the anchor church, the, the band's church was a block away. And I told my band, Hey, I think I'm going to go to this church and, um, walked in same kind of worship was very slow, very ambient. I wept the entire time, both services. Um, and I went home and I thought this is, I'm moving to Nashville. This is my next step. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So moved to Nashville. Didn't, I didn't have anything lined up and I just knew that's what I should do. And the day that I landed in Nashville, there is this woman, uh, talking about her work in Africa and working with the tribes in Ethiopia and how she's a part of this like artist, uh, missionary thing in Germany. And so I, I knew instantly like this is where my life is going and this is what I want to do next. So you just jumped right in. I mean, you were like, I'm, uh, yeah. you were, you were sort of, you sort of didn't have any, you didn't have any anchors down. So you're just like, well, wherever the, sh- wherever the sail takes me, right. Or the wind takes that's me. That's kind of, that's kind of how I felt like with God. I mean, like I was willing to do anything because I, right. I, I, from that first experience that I had, I was willing to give anything and, um, at all cost. And there, you know, so from the, from the time I moved to Nashville to the time I went to Germany, it was about a year and a half jump. Okay. So there's some time in between there, but, sure. um, yeah. Did you, did you find your being that passionate and that willing to sort of do anything? Did you find yourself like feeling alienated even within church culture? Yeah, uh, totally. Because, um, you get into this really judgmental mindset of like, uh, why am I so passionate and you're not, um, Right, but then there's but then there's all this language of calling and uh, destiny and purpose, and uh, you you tend to buy into that, and you think you're somebody special, and you think you're above everybody huh. else, and you, you think God has placed this special anointing over your life, sure, and so yeah, yeah. you you know what I mean? You buy into all these weird ideas, right. and um, so you just go for it. Yeah, yeah, hmm. that's interesting. How long was it between you talking to this woman who was in missions to when you actually left and went? Into missions it was a, it was about a year and a half. Wow, okay. that's pretty fast. Um, yeah, yeah. What happened in between then was so we've kind of got to re- re- revisit my teenage years. So I had a like I was a brand new Christian in language that they would use at the time. I was brand new. Um, I was a baby Christian. Um, oh yeah. I had things to learn. And so, and, but I also had healing that I needed because you have like, I was in my first cult, you know, essentially. And, um, so there was a lot to deal with and a lot to like, I had to refigure out who God was like Mm -hmm. over and over again. It was a process. Right. So I, I did the church's ministry school and that, um, in between meeting her and then going into missions. So there was a, that was what was in between the two. Uh, okay. So, so you, um, so you find yourself in Germany. Is this, I mean, is this like a long, are you, are you going to be there for a while? Like, is this a long-term mission? Is it a short-term mission? And- I went into it thinking, um, I didn't know where it was going, but I knew that I didn't want it to be some flippant short-term thing, you know? So I knew going into it that it was only, only going to be about a six month program. Seven, it was seven months. I don't, I'm susceptible to cults. So I kind of had this running thought of like, it's only seven months, but I could see myself giving my life to it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, yeah, yeah. So, was there yeah. uh, was there something about your? I mean, was there something about your family dynamic or the way that you interacted socially or something that that you think made you more susceptible to that kind of of thing? Like, do, 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 do were you like uh, were you looking for a community like that bad, or were you just that? sold out on what you believed or you know what was what was it that led you to like want that extreme kind of scenario do you think there's an there's 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 a number of variables that go into that so um number one was this feeling of constant communion with an interventionist god like a, a god that really loves you wants to be in your life controls every facet of your life um and in this culture, it was like, a, you know, it's worship culture, worship band culture. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's very charismatic worship. So it was very um, emotionally charged, emotionally charged. Yeah. And like I said, I came from a family that I didn't really vibe with. Mm-hmm. Um, 
on common interest, like I had a great family, so they'll probably listen to this. I had a great family. Uh, my parents were great providers, but like on a common interest level, it mm-hmm. just wasn't there. Sure. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then, so when you find this deity that is so in- interested and involved in your life, you'll uh-huh. do anything. Right, so. right, right. Uh, Corey, yeah. we know that you're going to tell your whole story on your, um, on your podcast, which is yeah. coming. When is that coming out by the way? Well, right now, mid February, mid February, and they can find it on iTunes. Yep, it's already there. Oh my goodness. Everybody subscribe. Um, so we know you're going to tell your whole story there, but can you fill really quickly the gap between the story you just told us and how you got onto the mission field? Sure. So I did YWAM, the seven month program, and um, that's kind of uh, was guilty. Okay, so real quick, sorry, that's youth with a mission, right? Because. Oh God, I'm so, sorry. We got, so we got in trouble. It's like really easy to just call it YWAM for people that are familiar with it. People that are familiar with it are like, oh God, YWAM. But we got in trouble not- uh, with this for like on our missionary uh, training. You know, they're like, don't use acronyms because you'll just confuse people. Right, um, right, right. Yeah. So youth, youth with a mission, discipleship, dis- discipleship which is a school. Which is a very, very big, popular, uh, charismatic, uh, kind of wild missionary organization for anybody that's not yes. familiar with it. Anyway, go yeah. ahead, continue. I'm sorry. Yeah, so I went to YWAM, did the seven month program. I was guilted into. I mean, this is a common thing for people. I uh, was guilted into a two to five year staff commitment to stay on, and I ended up not doing that right away. So I went back to the states. I was a part of uh, the startup missions organization for bands called Come and Live, and um, about th- two and a half years into that, that kind of bombed, and. Um, because I wanted to be this radical servant for God, I went back to YWAM to fulfill my commitment to them. Cool. So, uh, so a lot of uh, Corey's deconstruction story sort of happens in this in this uh, experience with YWAM. So, uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we get back, we're going to dive into that aspect of it. Hey, Chuck, remember tithing? Uh, you mean that thing in the Old Testament where they were supposed to give 10% of their money to the Levites that the modern church used to replace what Jesus taught about Christians giving all their possessions to the poor? Yeah, that. Well, I think I figured out a way to make it cheaper and easier. How's that? Patreon. It's an online crowdfunding tool where people can support the art they like by automatically donating monthly amounts of money. Do we have one for the life after? We do. You can go to patreon.com backslash the life after, or there's a link from our website, thelifeafter.org, under the website menu. I'll chuck it out. I'm not saying that. You have to say chuck it out. (laughs) And we're back. You're listening to The Life After. Uh, We're here with our guest, Corey Pig, who has um uh he's become a, a christian as a teenager sort of like uh outside of his outside of his uh parents you know uh culture right like he's he's doing his own kind of charismatic thing um he is in and out of a cult already um and he's in nashville and uh and eventually finds his way uh, into training with YWAM, Youth with a Mission, the massive mission organization. And uh, that leads him to a, a mission trip in Germany that proved to be quite the challenge. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, um, I had a staff commitment that I was guilted into about five, uh, four or five years before this time. And, um, so when, when my, la- when come and live started going downhill, um, I picked up commun- communication with them and they had assured me that, that we were planting a new base and everything was awesome and everything was set up. And, um, so I broke the news to my family on Thanksgiving dinner that I was moving to Germany full time to be a missionary. My mom freaked out, right. ran out of the room crying. Oh. Uh, I, I get Poor on a mom. plane Get over to Germany, realized I was lied to about everything. Nothing was put together. And um, I wanted to come home about a month into being there. I found out through a family friend that my parents were getting a divorce. Oh, and, oh Jesus. Um, okay. Yeah. So there's a, and a lot of moving parts. And, um, you know, the YWAM has, well, the base that I was with, they have this uncanny way of, um, well, that's, you know, that's life. That's just a distraction. You've got to stay here and fulfill your commitment. Like you've already committed. And, um, they use a lot of language of, uh, 
if you leave us, you're going to leave your potential and that, that kind of stuff. Okay. Yeah. 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 So I stay, you know, you, your fingers wrapped around these leaders and, um, all the while I'm like having like any kind of private time I get to myself, I'm having a breakdown because I'm processing family trauma. And also like, I hate my life in Germany. It's nothing of what I was promised. And, uh, we moved to Nuremberg where we're going to plant the space. And, uh, we, I was, pra- all of us were practically homeless for three to four months. Thank oh God. My God there were German, like we, they guilted the German pastors in the area to take us in. Um, you know, so we were all spread out, but, um, and the, the German pastor, the German pastors were like, why didn't they plan better? You know? Right. I like, right. Oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so our base did us, uh, an arts and mission school called marriage of the arts. And, um, it brought in every year about 120, 130 people from all over the world. And we didn't have anywhere for these students to stay. So we didn't even know if, if the thing was going to happen. Um, and the school happens, they shove the kids in a building that wasn't zoned for housing. Um, they, oh my God. it was just a lot of logistical flaws, like no kitchen, bare minimum bathrooms. They had to bike a mile to get to showers. Um, Jesus. What? It was a constant shit show. Right. And then, so to, to fast forward a couple of months down the road, um, they didn't even do this proper visas for the students. So the students became illegal in Germany. And, oh no. um, so I was in this like limbo state of like, do I stay or do I go, you know, go home for the holidays or do I like stay in Germany? Well, um, I didn't want to go home and be with my family because that was just be confronted with a lot of trauma. Um, yeah. and I knew that for a short visit, that wouldn't be a good thing. Cause I knew I'd come back to Germany. So they, offered me a spot to be an outreach leader to China. I'd been to China before. I loved it. I, China's like one of my favorite countries in the world. Okay. Um, and so I've n- never filled out visa paperwork before, but now I'm doing it for 25 students because that's how big my team is. Oh my God. And I asked my leader, I said, Hey, uh, if they Google this address, it's going to tell them that we're YWAM and we won't get visas. And he, they're like, we've done this several times. Like, just do it. It'll be fine. Did it. Uh, Went to Munich. The consulate was like, uh, yeah, we did a quick Google search. We found out that you're in YWAM and that's a terrorist organization in China. Um, (laughs) Well, you know, can we just talk for a minute about how China's got it right? (laughs) (laughs) Well, yeah, totally. I mean, in China, it doesn't matter what your faith is. It's illegal to proselytize your faith. So, and that's every faith. Um, so, but YWAM is on the radar because they're the, like the biggest, one of the biggest missions organizations. So, um, that I had to go to Munich like every single day, uh, to the, to the visa thing and tensions were high. Like I still hadn't processed my family stuff. And, um, my then pastor texted me overnight. Uh, he's like old school. So he's like taking pictures of every page of the chapter. And, but, but, but at the beginning of this Henry Nouwen book, there's a Buddhist parable, uh, Kisa Gotami and the mustard seeds. And in, in short, um, it's basically a woman whose son had died and she goes to the Buddha and she's asking for refuge and healing. And the Buddha looks at her and says, um, if you can go to, if you can go, go to any house in the city and get a certain amount of ingredients, but you have to get it from a house that death hasn't touched, bring the ingredients and your son back and I'll heal your son. And the woman goes house to house to house, exhausts herself. Every house has the ingredients she needs, but death has touched every single house. And the Buddha knew what he was doing and it took her till the very end to realize he just set herself up for, Hey, you have to come to terms. Like everybody suffers. That's life. Um, and like the only way to get through it is to be with it and to accept it. Mm. And, um, I broke down on the bus. Like I wept, like I'm sure the people on the bus probably thought I went through a bad breakup, Mm. but that was the moment that I realized interventionist God had died. And Mm. Mm -hmm. here I am stuck in Germany. I hate my life. My parents are divorced. Um, and I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Mm. So you kind of did go through a bad breakup. Right, right. I did, yeah. It was bad. It was really bad, especially when God's your whole world and currently your vocation, right? Right, and right. Krampus and was coming. <laughs> not to mention that I'm leading 25 students on their outreach that they paid thousands of dollars to be on. So, right, 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 yeah. 
the Chinese government, it, they, they're like, um, Hey, everybody can come in if you sign a letter of declaration and intent, but you have two minors on your outreach team and, um, they can't come because that's just anti-trafficking laws. There's so many things with that. Uh, so I take yeah. that to the leaders and the leader says, you need to learn how to fight for people. So here's what we're going to do. We're oh going to send the two minors into Hong Kong and they're going to get visas into China. We've done this before. It works great. The girls got stuck in Hong Kong for six days. No little to no care. How old are uh, they? Ran out of 17 16 and 17. Oh, no. oh my God. <laughs> my stipulations were that this was not allowed unless the parents agreed to it and the girls agreed to it. Uh-huh. And um, the leadership was like, Oh yeah, we're going to check. They didn't check. They didn't even tell the girl, they told the girls what they were going to do, but they didn't really give them the option of saying no. Oh, oh God. my God. Jesus. Girls go to Hong Kong, stuck there, stranded six days, go by. And they Hong, get Hong Kong, because it's effectively a separate government, right? So they, they have, right. It's easier to get them in Hong Kong than it is to get them into mainland China. Yeah, totally. <laughs> So they come to Beijing and I'm looking through their passports because I, I have to know what kind of visa they got. And I flip and mind you, you've got to remember, my students are illegal in Germany. So we have to stay out of Europe now for 90 days. The oh Schengen God. zone. So I'm looking through the passports and I notice the girls only got 30 days and with one renewal. And that's it. And um, whereas the rest of the team had different visas. And so I was like, God damn it. Like I'm going to have to now figure out how are we going to survive for three months on another part of the world? Um, Jesus. And so we, this, this is literally how it all went down. Um, we get back to the apartment. I looked to my co-leader Alexa and I said, Hey, we have everybody here. Let's throw a fucking party. Like let's get pizza and sodas. And, Cause we're missionaries and we don't drink, you know, <laughs> but, um, and she, right. you know, the team was like, yeah, we need to celebrate everybody's year. Like we're doing fine, kind of. Um, and that there's a married couple missing and they were pregnant. And so I go down to my apartment that I shared with them and I walk in and I find the wife crying and she's like, I just passed the baby. Oh, um, God. Oh, no. oh, no. And so I am like. How in the fuck do I reconcile? Like, so I go back upstairs to where all the kids are. And they're, when I say kids, for anybody listening, they're like anywhere from 16 to 25. Even one of them was like in the 30s. So I go up and see all the kids like eating pizza. They're getting excited. And, you know, everybody's oh here. God. Everything's good. And I. Oh, what a say, scene. I go like hide in Alexa's bedroom. She's my co-leader. And I'm like, we need to talk. And I told her the news. And I said, like, we can't hide it we got to tell the team. And so we told the team and it like killed the pizza party. Like people are crying and like they hate life. Oh they my should God. hate life. Uh, they have every right to hate life. Yeah. And um, that set the tone for our outreach and our outreach. We literally wasted two months in China, just trying to figure out what the hell we were even there for. And we didn't even give a shit about missions at this point. We, we were doing our best just to love each other and also hope that we had enough resources to keep surviving because oh my you gotta remember we, we misbudgeted because we budgeted for a 60 day outreach. We were there for 90. <laughs> so there, there was a lot of emergency fundraising. Uh, kids were kind, some of them were scared that we wouldn't have food for dinner, you know? And I, I would always be like, trust me, I will make sure we eat, you know, like, but, yeah. um, Oh my God. Luckily the, the, uh, the wife that had miscarried though, she was very good friends with one of the teachers of the school. And he's, I still think he's a stand up guy. Um, and she was like, I want to reach out to him. He's going to be in Korea. So she sets up all of this with this guy, sets up all of this cool stuff for us to go to Korea. And I bust my ass. We all bust our ass to get to Korea, like fundraising, doing crazy stuff to, to get there. Well, I'm realizing like I've got to fly with the Europeans. Otherwise they lose their reentry visa back to China to catch their return flight home. So Alexa, oh you've got to go up. You've got to go by boat with the Americans. I hit up these school, like the, the, the YWAM base used a travel agent and I hit him up. He, doesn't book proper flights for our team. And I didn't find this out till later, but so we, we fly over, we get into Korea. Korea is a great time. The churches knew that we had had like a traumatic last five months and they're dumping thousands of dollars, just taking care of us. Get, you know, it costs a lot to have that many people abroad. 
Um, they, they treated us like King and Queens fast forward to the end of the whole trip. And it, Alexa takes the Americans back on the boat to China. And, uh, you know, you wake up that mo- it's like you, you can kind of have this intuition, like something's not going to go right today. Okay. Um, and, and so I get up with my European students and I just have this gut feeling something's off. Something's not right. Alexa's on the ocean with the Americans. So I don't have contact with them. And, you know, you just hope for the best. We get to the airport and we realize um, everybody is illegal f- for all of our flights except me because a travel agent booked flights with layovers and by Chinese policy, um, if you're coming back for that transit visa ha- at that time, I don't know if it's changed, but you had to have direct flights, no layovers. And so we were kicked out of all of our flights to catch our return flight home to Germany. Oh my God. No ma- and, um, yeah, so we were, like we were left stranded in Seoul, and I, I remember I just collapsed on the floor, and the students were like, "It's not your fault. It's not your fault." I'm like, "I'm fucking tired. Like, yeah, I j- this has been seven months of complete hell." Yeah. Um, and so by this time, I just had a really fuck it mentality. But um, the base got us home. I ended up just cussing the leaders out in a private meeting and just handing it to him and being like, I'm fucking out. Like, I don't care about a two year, five year commitment. I'm out. I'm done. How did they respond to to that? Well, initially their response was you have no right to treat your leaders like this. Like they, they, but they do everything for you. They've sacrificed so much for you. Um, And, and, and here you are like you, yell at them on Skype for not taking care. You, you accuse them for not taking care of the students, which that was the student's opinion. Also, right. I got the opinion from them and from observing. Right. Um, but that was, and that was enough for me to be like, I'm, I'm done. Like you can't say this. You can't make me feel bad. Yeah. Um, and so I pack up, go back to Nuremberg. We're in Herrenhut as like a brother base at that time. And so we go to Nuremberg, uh, me and my roommates, we all had traumatic experiences. Like my roommate, uh, who's a co-host on the show, he led an outreach in Lebanon. So you have something in common, Brady. Hey. Um, so we pack up, we go home and I kind of just feel this void in life. Uh, the feeling that you feel when interventionist God is dead and mm. that person that you talk to that you loved is no longer there. It's kind of like, a funeral and you're mourning, but you're also still living. So you're trying to process like, how do I move forward? You know? Right. I really like that you refer to God consistently as interventionist, interventionist God. God. I really like that because it's like, it, and it's so pertinent to your story, right? Because you sort of like, you read this poem and you're already like struggling what's happening with this mission trip and like your own faith and stuff. And you read this poem and you, and that's like your, that's like your, your funeral, as you described it, your funeral for intervention is God, which is really interesting. And then like everything that follows that is like, evidence that interventionist god is not there it's not real at all like no there's no there's no point on this trip where you're like man god really came through you know <laughs> you're just like this is a fucking mess and you yeah. know yeah i had students that because of the chinese way of doing things like it's ve- like once you get in china um it's very quiet like social media is not allowed um, your normal life that you're comfortable with, it's totally different mm-hmm. there. And so you do, um, there's a tendency to feel isolated and it scares people. And that brought up a lot of weird theological things with some of my students. And they felt the overwhelming conviction of like, what are we going to do? Like all of these people are Buddhist and Taoist and, oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they're like, they're going to go to hell. Like, and I'm like, guy, I, I don't, I don't really believe in hell. Like, and that, this was like, I'm like, shit, Corey, you've got to monitor yourself because these people, like I had to daily remind myself, like they paid to like have this missionary experience. And here I am like, I don't fucking think God exists anymore, but I also (laughs) really don't think in hell, I believe in hell and, um, sorry. (laughs) Right. Right. Um, did you, how did you handle that? Were you just honest with them or did you sort of censor yourself? I, I do remember in the moment that I, I, I have always had this thing about my personality where I think the way that I phrased it in the time, if I can put myself back in that mindset, I think 
I played up the God card. Like I think God exists. Um, and I think that if God is really who he says he is, I used a gender, uh, then how could he send millions of people in North Korea to hell when they don't have the opportunity to hear? <laughs> right. Um, right, right. As like, if God, if that God does that, then that's not a God worth following. And that was kind of a Brennan Manning approach to that. I really sure. loved his work. So, yeah, yeah. um, yeah. I think in the moment I, I, I answered it true to who I was in the moment, but I obviously have my honest reflections that I would admit now, you know? Um, but yeah. Cool. Thanks, Corey. Um, so we're going to, we're going to take another quick break. When, uh, when we get back, we're going to talk about, uh, what Corey's up to now. Um, he's doing a lot of cool stuff. He's involved with some pretty, some pretty rad people and, uh, he is uh, working on deconstructing this whole, not just YWAM, but the the whole like uh, idea of of Western missions the way we understand them. So when we get back, we're going to get into that. What is that? I'm calling it a. Grrr. It's a new letter I've been working on. You're right, Chuck. We've always had 26, but I think we could really benefit from having 27. Oh, Brady, I asked you to make a newsletter, not a new letter. Oh. Like we could put a link on our website and have listeners sign up to receive an email newsletter whenever we have updates. Exactly like that. Yeah, okay, I, I could get that ready by the time we release this. Sounds great. Sign up for the newsletter at thelifeafter.org. Welcome back to Life After. This is Brady Hart, and I'm here with Chuck Parson and our guest for the week, Corey Pig. Corey, uh, you just told us your story about uh, leaving YWAM and leaving Missions Organization, which also kind of like led to you leaving the faith. Um, I have two questions for you. Can you you kind of worded something interesting earlier that I liked. You called it the funeral for the interventionist God. What does that mean to you? It's when you realize that the invisible best friend that you had in your life dies and um it's really a lot to grieve like it took it took me about two years to grieve it to be honest but i mean looking back at it you realize that that form of god didn't even exist so it's like because i understand the grieving process i had to go through it as well but how Mm -hmm. how weird is it to explain a grieving process for something that doesn't and never did exist you know like what did that look like for you I'll compare it to my parents that divorced uh, because a divorce yeah. and when you're an adult versus when you're a kid is like attending a funeral and everybody's still living. Oh, um, yeah, and it's yeah. the weirdest exactly. thing to grieve because you are still looking at all of the variables of life that once existed. They're not going away. Um, and you, the, you cannot be healed of trauma. Um, trauma is something that your body stores and it's something that you have to learn to reorient your life around And so for me, it was this process of realizing that, um, I bought into a lot of lies and I owned that. And, um, but that was such a big part of my life that it became a part of me. And it's something that I probably won't ever shake because I, it left me with a craving for the curious mysteries of life. Mm. And it's something that I'll probably chase throughout the rest of my life. So, um, yeah, but in a very different way now, I mean, you have a lot of freedom in the way that you can do that now. That yes, you, totally. Right? Yeah, 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 totally. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. And listening to you talking about grieving this process and everything, um, I'm making an assumption about you and that's probably that you've, you've gone through therapy like the rest of us. Is that true? Yes. Yeah. Uh, how far after leaving YWAM did you, were you able to finally get therapy? I'm going to be honest. It was n- four or five months maybe because there was a big period of shock Mm -hmm. and um, I didn't know really where to go and what to turn to. Um, Yeah. So maybe four to five months. That's like early. I feel like. Yeah. That's pretty fast. It took, yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a good time to start that. It took two years for, for you to like process that experience. Right. I mean, like, I mean, there's sort of like, there was a lot of religious trauma in that, you know, that you had to go through going back to when you're a teenager, but you also, I mean, it, it took, it took a couple of years for you to, to get through. A lot of that was just the YWAM experience, right? I mean, like just mm-hmm. that three months of, of chaos, right? Yeah. I have this thing about my personality where, um, it's that same drive that got me into missions. It's that same drive that took me across the world a couple of times. And it's that, 
I don't know what label to put on that, but if something happens in my life, I've got to figure it out quick. Um, and it bugs the shit out of me if I can't figure it out. Okay. So I knew right away things were not good. Um, but I didn't know how bad it was and I didn't know exactly where to turn. Um, so I kind of just tried every doorknob until the right door opened, if that makes sense. Yeah. And as I went through different doors, um, I realized different things that needed to be dealt with. And, um, yeah, it was kind of a journey. That was kind of how the journey played out. Um, you mentioned earlier about how the the leaders of YWAM responded to your criticisms then. Did they ever come around? Were they ever more willing to listen to you? Were there any that kind of helped you out or anything no. like that? No. So Never. What, their attitude this entire time has just been, why did you question us and you have no right to do that? Uh, if I can recall history correctly, uh, I didn't leave on good terms and I actually didn't feel comfortable talking to them face to face. I ended up writing an email to them, letting them know that I would not be coming back. Um, that was how it finally played out after the private meeting that I had mentioned earlier. Didn't have any contact with them until a year later when there was like a online crisis through on a thread that I started and um, they pretty much showed that they'd they pretty much said with their words they didn't care you know their their actions showed they didn't care if you had to boil down their issues of why there was so much disorganization and like one or two sentences what would you say was their like overall reason behind why there was such a shit show i think there's a lot of variables that play into it um on an organizational level ywam prides themselves on being decentralized decentralized in theory sounds good because it allows um, cultures to thrive in different parts of the world. And there's no overarching, like you have to be this culture where that becomes a bad thing is Americans can go to Germany and start a base and they can do whatever the hell they want with no oversight. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times what you find in YWAM is people are doing this vocation out of a place of extreme um, inner loneliness. And they, um, I mean, it's kind of a, pun for this movement because they talk about the orphan and the, and the father, but there's a lot of orphan mentality that goes into the missionary. And a lot of people act like orphans and a way that they treat others and the way they execute their visions and their dreams. And it's a me, me, me kind of doggy dog world. Um, and if you're not serving them, then you're of no use to them. Hmm. What were kind of some of the things that you started to find out about yourself after leaving missions and becoming more open with yourself through therapy, et cetera? When I had this, what I would consider an extreme encounter with God in high school, I had no qualms with any part of myself. And the more steeped I got in Christian culture, the more I realized I had to take something out of myself to be something I'm not. Mm. And um, because I so wanted to be wrapped up in this interventionist God and culture and calling and vocation and whatever, um, I was willing to assimilate and lie. And I lied about a lot of things. I fake believed all the right things. And I um, pushed my sexuality aside and I thought that I was healed and, you know, that life was good. Um, the more I got steeped into Christianity, the more I realized that it was going to cost me a part of myself. And um, I got to Nashville and there, the soon after I moved there, there was a guy who used to be an ex-gay or he claimed that he was once gay and now married. And I felt safe in trusting him with my sexuality. I had never told anybody why well, I had told a few close friends that I grew up with in childhood, but um so I confided this information to him that, hey, my sexuality is fluid. fluid, um, And yeah, I feel like I should confide that into you and ask you to pray for healing. <laughs> That's who I was at that time. And he did, and he gave me some encouraging words, but he also outed it to my church leaders, which I didn't know. And I didn't find that out until two years later when that pastor outed my life to a group of his friends at a poker game, oh, which God. one of them happened to be my mentor. What? And he called me and he was like, Hey, I, I was just at this poker game and I heard that you were gay. And, um, I was like, you know, 
no, that's not true at that time. It, and that answer was kind of multifaceted. Like, right. It wasn't true. I never said I was gay. I said my sexuality was fluid. So if you wanted to throw a label on it, it would be bisexual. But, um, I lied because I wanted to be this missionary and I wanted to, I had this calling that God had given me. So I was like, well, that's not true. Um, and I downplayed it. And then I called the pastor and I was like, what the hell are you doing saying this stuff at a poker game? And then he was like, it's, it's true, isn't it? Why does it matter? And I'm like, it's not yours to tell. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, but I brushed that conversation off with, no, it's not true. Uh, because you know, again, I wanted to be this right. God fearing missionary. Right. So then years down the road, um, when I reconnect with this pastor, uh, the only thing that he can bring up to try to aid my questioning and trauma is, Oh, you once struggled with your sexuality. Do you think that has anything to do with, um, everything that you're processing today. And it's like, I'm trying to fucking put my life back together. Uh, I just lost my faith. My parents are divorced. Um, and I've given my life for the last six years to this joke. And the last thing I've thought about is my sexuality. I haven't thought about that in five years. Um, so that led me through a path of embodiment. I call it embodiment. Um, and so for the longest time I thought that I was asexual and because I, I had no interest in guys. I had no interest in girls. Um, and, uh, I, but I was a, he- like a heavily supporter, uh, a big supporter of the LGBTQIA continuum because of that, uh, co-authored the accurate Nashville statement with a couple of friends here in town. And, um, after that I saw a movie, I don't know if it's okay to talk about this stuff, but saw call me by your name and, um, oh, yeah. hard break. That, mo- that movie for me, I like, I call it local anesthesia to some deep wounding. It was like, it allowed me to feel around and move things around. And I realized like, I'm not asexual. Like I'm lying to myself about that. Yeah. And I'm lying to myself about that because of repression culture. Mm. And because I actually maybe fell in love with some of my old coworkers in the mission field. And because that didn't work out. And because some relationships with females that I had dated have like, um, very intensely, that didn't work out. Um, I wrote it all off and kind of wanted to run away from it. Right. So I, re- and I realized like, you know what? Like I, I want to live my life to the fullest and I don't want to live with limits. So um, I'm going to embrace every part of about me. And so uh, now I would tell people like, I'm, I would admit, I would be honest about my sexual fluidity. I really don't like labels. I joked with Brady on chat earlier today and I'm like, I kind of bounce around the whole alphabet except Q uh, except uh, T and I, which those are, you know, obviously you don't go there. I don't know how to say that. Like, you know, but, you know, if you're T or I, you know what I mean? Like, it's, yeah, it's you know, if you're T or yeah. I, but like, I can't figure out if I'm like G B Q or a, sure. yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah. So, um, but it's just this process of homecoming and belonging and coming home to yourself and, and loving yourself for everything you are. So, um, am I a Buddhist? No, but I go to Buddhist practice weekly, multiple times a week. Um, I don't, I don't subscribe to Christianity. Um, and I would probably say today that I'm reverently agnostic. Um, yeah. So, uh, that's it's quite a story that's that's quite a story man uh there's some there's a lot there's some really painful stuff in there there's some really like you're you're in the process of overcoming a lot still i mean you've you've only really been out of the faith like under a year right i mean like right around two, a year two years two years oh two years. two years okay cool okay uh so what do you what are you up to now like what are you uh sort of what are you doing with that experience and how are you how are you using that now I mean, you've got this podcast coming up. You're working yeah. with the liturgists. Like, that's obviously yeah. meaningful. Tell um, us about that. Yes. About a year into the recovery process, I got to this phase in life where I wanted to do, to do something life-giving again. And so, I knew Michael Gunger. And I a friend had recommended the liturgist. And I listened to an episode that really resonated with me because it touched these sensitive parts of my soul um, about this ability of does God speak to people? Does he, does God not? I try not to use pronouns. I'm sorry. Um, and, um, so I hit, I hit them up because I felt like these, they were doing a great job at helping people reconnect with finding their way forward, you know, and getting out of regret, whatever that looks like to them. And that's kind of where I wanted to go in life. 
And um, we met for a job interview at a festival in North Carolina. And after a sh- short 30 minute conversation, they're like, you're in, like you're it. And so I've been with them two years now, cool. almost two years. Awesome. And um, I'm starting another show called Failed Missionary and we where we talk about all of the myths and um, lies about the mission field. And we debunk this, like missions is kind of like the golden calf of Christianity that you don't touch and it never gets talked about. And yeah. I felt like, um, you know what? It's one thing to deconstruct and I'm not negating that because it's a big thing and I'm not writing that off, but it's another thing to give your life to a vocation that's built all around all of those beliefs and lose all of it. It's hard. Wow, absolutely. And, um, so I wanted to give that there's a large demographic that has no resources on how to process finding their way forward vocationally. Yep. So I wanted to start failed missionary also to build community and to uh, provide resource for those healing from that kind of trauma. So, you know what I like about Corey? What's that Brady? Here's one thing I'm noticing about you, Corey, <clears throat> that I appreciate that. I think a lot of our listeners are going to understand. And that's that you have brought up a couple of themes about your own personality. One of them being that you want to do things that are life giving, right? And that mm-hmm. happened before you were a Christian, while you were a Christian. And now, after you're a after. Christian. And I think that some of us have certain personality traits like that, that we thought were only in us because of Christianity. Right. And when we walked away from Christianity, we thought we'd lose those or they weren't really a part of us. And when I was yeah. deconstructing, there was a good friend of mine who told me uh, on the phone, she says, Brady, you know, you are still that empathetic, caring person that you've always been. And I feel that I'm more free to be more loving and empathetic now as a non-Christian, um, as a post-Christian than yeah. I was as a Christian. Definitely. And and I and I yeah. want to thank you so much because I feel like your story personifies that so much and you're working your ass off now to get these resources out to people to help lives and to change situations. You're no different than you were before. You care about the same mm. things and they weren't a fruit of the spirit. They were a fruit of your humanity. And I want to yeah. thank you so much for sharing your stories with us today. Cause I think that's, thank you. that's huge. I think that's huge. Totally. Absolutely. When I reflect on the whole story of my, of my life so far, I'm 30 this year. Um, I think of like this lonely kid that felt like the black sheep in his family that found this deity that was like a life source and gave purpose. But to me, that wasn't the end all be all. It was just the outlet for me to find my purpose in a world where I felt like I didn't fit in. And I gave myself over to getting beat around quite heavily by two aggressive cults and a lot of bad spiritual abuse. And, um, on the flip side of all of it, I realized that, um, this purpose of meaning can be found in mindfulness. Like when you feel your own breath, you feel your Mm. own, yeah. Um, heartbeat. You yeah. look around at like the various ways the universe works and you see how intricate and all, all of it works together. You really, I don't know, for me, you just realize like this path of uh, finding meaning, it comes from everything. And um, yeah, it's not wow. found in, it's not found in one thing. Yeah. That's awesome. It's huge. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Uh, so failed missionary, uh, it is available to subscribe to now and you've got episodes coming out hypothetically, right? Mid February, mid February. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, Corey, thanks so much for sharing your story with us. Thanks for opening up. Thanks for uh, sharing your life after with us. Um, Also, check us out on Facebook. We do have a a secret Facebook group where we've got people who are going through religious trauma. Uh, Chuck, talk on us a little bit. Uh, yeah. So the, the secret Facebook group. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's, a it's a community of really amazing, funny, uh, interesting, sometimes sad, broken, confused, um, sassy. people on a sassy people uh, that are on a, on a journey to, to find their way after, uh, losing the way that they used to find their way. So if you're interested in joining us, you can message us, uh, message our uh, Facebook page, uh, The Life After, facebook.com slash The Life After, and um, hit us up. And thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Corey, for joining us. Hey, Corey. Corey, I want to remind you of something. If you don't don't go to church Sunday, it's just the second Saturday. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you all very much for listening. (laughs) 